Good evening, and thank you for all joining us as we discuss the academic and career steps needed in order to become a psychologist in South Africa. My name is Kirsten Harrison, and I'll be your host this evening. Before we proceed, there are some house rules that I'd like to bring to your attention. Please be advised that we'll have a short Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to send us your questions in the Q&A box while you are listening to our panelists. Kindly note that this session is recorded and will be shared on our social media platforms. We are aware that there's high internet usage in the country, thus slowing down connection in some areas, and we ask for your patience. As is the case with many, we are also working from home and ask that you bear with us if you, if you hear a microwave ping, a baby cry, or a truck pass in the background. To better help us understand how to become a psychologist in South Africa, we have Sherith Langenhoven, who will be speaking about being a registered counselor and the roles a registered counselor can play in the community. And then we'll hear from our lovely colleague, Nabila Davis, who will share her SACAP journey with us and highlight the study pathways to becoming a psychologist. Without any further delays, I will now hand over to Sherith. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Sherith Langenhoven, and I am a B Psych qualified counselor, as well as a PGCE qualified uh, teacher and an MA psychology, uh, a research psychology professional. So um, I'm going to speak to you a bit about my journey and a bit of insight into the Bachelor of Regional Counselors qualification just so that you can get an idea of what lies ahead if you decide to um, go into the profession of psychology. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, the Register of Counselor and the community um, or NGO work that we will, that you engage on or engage in when you are, are qualified, you will be able to conduct counselling and these are brief term, short-term counseling interventions. It's not around uh, diagnoses. It's not around uh, mental illness. It is about um, your day-to-day -day difficulties and challenges in life. And when I'm speaking to that, I'm speaking about relationship issues, challenges with self-esteem, difficulties with um, uh, work difficulties, any sort of general life challenges that people face that they struggle to overcome um, without the intervention or assistance or support of a registered counselor. So bear in mind that only one in six people, and I don't want to minimize the amount, but one in six people actually suffer or struggle with mental illness. So the other five of the six is the ones in the individuals that we get to work with. So even though we don't diagnose and we don't do clinical work, what we do do is help the majority of our population in South Africa. And that was a massive part of my um, first job or employment opportunity, which I will speak to later. Then what we can do is refer, um, we are trained as B-Psych or registered counselors to be able to identify when there is mental health challenges that we cannot and or that is outside our scope of practice. And that's when we are able to refer to psychologists um, which are clinical or counseling or even to psychiatrists depending on the severity of the presenting case. We are then also able to um, conduct workshop or facilitations. And when I speak about that, we do things like peer, um, peer group support, um, bullying um, interventions and group work, as well as things such as uh, grief support groups or ADHD support groups for moms and dads and family members or for the, those struggling with ADHD themselves. So this is how we either workshop um, around different topics, as well as provide a supportive space for people um, struggling um, in certain areas in their lives. And so that brings us also to research. If you have a qualification or degree in psychology, you are able to conduct research within different institutions such as UCT, Stellenbosch. And so undergraduates, which are people with a three to four year degree, can, uh, on, can be employed by these institutions to be able to conduct psychological research. Currently, I'm employed with UCT and I'll speak to that again. Um, so you can gain some insight into the type of work that you would be involved in. We also are then involved in community project development. So 
up until things such as even assisting a community in developing a food garden or assisting them in developing a community support group for those with HIV AIDS, um, uh, training you know, staff or people or members in the community to go and care for people who are frail or, and the elderly. Uh, it's all about the skill set that we've been given to identify how to work in communities and how to identify difficulties or challenges in the communities and assist the community to develop projects to become their own um, sort of heroes and own um, people that take control and ownership of their um, lives in their communities. Then we also are able to do management of various psychosocial challenges, such as substance abuse challenges, uh, peer pressure, self-esteem, and all of these things. And a lot of it you might, it might sound always falls within um, adolescence, but there's different other aspects in life that um, even adults need to be educated on. And when we sit with that knowledge, we are able to bring that to people in groups or individually and assist them in understanding whatever it is the challenge is that they may be facing. We also, once you are qualified, you are also able then to manage students and volunteers. So you can provide a supportive role. And um, the beauty of that is, is that you get to transfer the, your skill set to others in this way and also your work experiences. Um, and this allows you to be able to um, guide others in the work that they want to do. And a good example is, is that there are usually substance abuse intervention programs in communities. And so these people or people that are involved in this are your day-to-day -day neighborhoods that really want to know how to um, support the community with such a challenge. And you can step into that role as a supervisor and provide them with debriefing and insight and, and training um, if necessary. And lastly, but not least, is lay counselor training. You will find that there are a lot of many established groups of people in communities that want to know how to support their community in different levels and different ways. Sometimes it's immigrants that want to support other immigrants in how to adjust to their new life. Uh, sometimes it's just a support group on how to support mothers of sons who are involved in gangsterism. And so they are people that really want to invest their time but don't have the skill set to really effectively help people in the community. So we are qualified enough to provide them with lay counseling training so that they can go into the communities and provide a greater support. So this is a range of things that we can do. And the B-side qualification specifically allows you to achieve this. The B-side qualification is a four-year degree. And once you are qualified, you are registered with the HPCSA. And through the HPCSA, you are afforded the scope of practice. That brings me to the next slide. So where can we work then? Um, various NGOs, um, universities, you can work in the education system. Once you have a degree, you are able to be a life orientation teacher as well as a school counselor. You can work in clinics um, and police stations as a trauma counselor or first respond counselor, or even just you know a day-to-day -day registered counselor providing some services um, for people that can't access counseling outside of the government spectrum. Then we also have religious institutions. If you are affiliated with religious institutions, you are able to approach them and, and offer your services um, or create a space for you to also provide counseling for, your, for people within that religion or within the religious institution that you attend. Then there are other opportunities such as SACAP, um, College of Cape Town, TVET or FET colleges, where we can teach life orientation, provide student support, provide um, also other sort of assessments that are available into opportunities for um, appropriate pro professional choosing or choices. And so what we really have then is you, you would intervene at the level of the students where they are facing the current challenges of the unknown and how to choose subjects and how to then enter into the workplace and which career best suits them is another avenue where we then can step in and assist. Then there's other organizations like Gamblers Anonymous, um, EAP programs that are linked to retailers um, where they actually uh, consult or they contract with a consultancy firm uh, who have registered counselors as their staff. And then those counselors either telephonically or 
by visiting different retail stores like Pick and Pay um, or ShopRite um, and various other stores provide a counseling support service to their employees at no cost. And that is what an e the assistance, uh, assistance, sorry, employee assistance program means. We also have the health department. Um, we have not necessarily been given a lot of job opportunities as yet in that sector, but we also are open to opportunities as in uh, providing the other areas apart from counseling where we are accepted and welcomed, such as psychoeducational programs. So it's just about really finding out and looking at your skill set and deciding where you really want to work or trying to see discover what it is that you enjoy doing, um, and then looking at how your skills that matches the job advertisements that you do encounter. We also then have the legal system, uh, which I will also speak to, which I'm currently involved in, where we can do family work and child maintenance and care work as well. And that comes with further training mostly, but it is an opportunity that you can in, um, take on. And um, identifying a need in the community and initiate your own NGO, we, there's a lot of times that now Bachelor of Psychology students have qualified as, as registered counselors who have gone into private practice. But I need to sort of let you know that there's not enough space for everyone in private practice. So most of us are doing different types of jobs in different types of areas and different types of um, spaces. And so not to let you think that, okay, I will step out of this qualification and into an office where I will get to sit and meet with people in a space um, that is controlled on a daily basis um, is not the reality of South Africa. Uh, I think it's important that you realize that when we're looking at the condition and the state of our country, that most of us are going to be working in townships. Most of us are going to be working in communities. Most of us are going to be counseling in spaces we might not have ever thought we would, but where people, where we need to meet the need of our clients and the people in our country. So we might even have to create our own space. Something that is um, quite interesting is, is that a student um, from SACAP had um, obtained funding from a private organization or institution and he then purchased a vehicle and with that vehicle he converted it into a counseling space and he drove that vehicle to the different townships providing counseling services to the to the poor communities and luckily for him um, the actual organization that sponsored everything would then pay his salary but they would have that arrangement that was made directly it's just that it's it so happens that he is an ex sacap student Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit of my professional journey. I qualified with my B-Site qualification in 2004. And um, it's significant because I was part of the first people to ever graduate with this qualification. And this qualification changed the world, the, all the life of psychology. Before this, you could only do a Bachelor of Psychology majoring in Arts. I'm sorry, a Bachelor of Arts majoring in Psychology. And um, the difficulty with that qualification was that you were not guaranteed to become a psychologist. And the numbers that were limited then into getting into a master's for clinical counseling uh, psychology is just as relevant now. And so a lot of students were left without future employment or, or training opportunities. And this was then the difficulty for the psychology profession. So they created the B-Psych program, which now allows us to work within communities covered by the Health Professions Council, and then ensuring that our, our service that we provide is ethical and, and correct and just for those that we serve with the training that we have. And um, so if I don't regret doing this qualification because you still have the option of not doing a B-Psych and just doing a three or four year degree. And it does not equate to the opportunities as you will see that I was afforded by doing B-Psych. So what B-Psych allows you is after the graduation, I was able to be um, uh, obtain employment immediately uh, with Sanka, which is a drug and alcohol um, program, uh, sorry, uh, NGO, and um, received additional training. So that makes me an addiction specialist as well. And so through that, I was able to do individual counseling, brief psychoeducation workshops, and also addiction treatment for short-term periods, and community work such as awareness campaigns, information sessions, and also supervised volunteers that were rolling out different campaigns in the communities. 
Lena also was involved in high schools, so peer counseling training and information sessions. And we also used to do, um, which was my most fun part, puppet shows. Uh, not necessarily something you think you would do after a four year degree, but it was definitely something that added a bit of fun to um, the mundane and quite very serious aspect of drug addiction work. Um, and that was my first job, which I then uh, was employed at Sanka for four years. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, what happened since then was um, psychology not being necessarily the best paid job at the time, things have improved. Um, I had decided to take a break from the addiction work and I decided to then go teach in South Korea, which is also an opportunity that's afforded to you. Anyone with a degree is able to then take a break before, after, whenever they want to, and also travel the world and teach English in a different country which I did for a year. And upon returning, I found that I actually enjoyed teaching. So I entered into the school education system where I was able to teach as a life orientation teacher and also work as a school counselor at various schools on a contract basis. And I could only work on a contract basis because I was not a qualified teacher. And with that, I completed my PGCE which then afforded me the opportunity to be able to then complete or be full-time employed by the education department. So that allows you also another opportunity. Anyone with the Richard Council's qualification can also um, continue to do a one-year postgraduate certificate in education and then teach at a school. You do not need that to be a school counselor though. And while you're there, you'll find that you being in the counseling space, you will also then need to engage in other activities. So I was part of the teachers that managed the community outreach um, program, the Interact Club, where youth would go into townships and we would actually either take materials to rebuild shacks, um, clothing to those that had no clothing, we'd, we'd source bedding and beds and other furniture in order to assist the elderly in the community. Um, and we also, that also afforded us to, you know, allow the students from those townships to see that even though you come from a township, it doesn't mean you have nothing to offer others. And um, so that was quite significant for me to experience in the township of Imizami here too in Hot Bay. And once I then realized that I was um, not able to sort of practice more in this community work that I really wanted to continue doing, um, I then decided to go and apply for my, my um, clinical psychology master's. I applied the first time and I was unsuccessful, which happens to many. And I realized, okay, I need to train myself a little bit more. And so I took a step back into education and I worked a bit further. And in 20... 13, I applied again. And one of the things that I discovered was that because I was in teaching, I was becoming more distant from the counseling work that I was accustomed to. And that was making it difficult for me to enter into the clinical counseling psychology space through the um, admissions process that is quite lengthy and quite intense. And so what I have done is I decided to um, resign from teaching and I then went and uh, rather registered for a master's in research psychology. And so with research psychology, I was in the interim unemployed and yet could still use my skill set. And I then joined a uh, institution called Come University, where I part-time taught work readiness training to um, students that had dropped out and now currently finishing and completing their matric year. So work readiness training isn't even part of something that you're officially trained in, but it's some, it's just to show you the type of skill set that you can continue to develop so that you remain employable. Then from there, also while completing my master's, I also worked at INCON, which is an employee assistance program, and I was able to then do um, telephonic counseling and referral for people that presented with different life challenges. And at the same time, because of my qualification while studying my master's, I was able to be a research assistant on a PhD project. I could do student marking for undergrad students at Salem Bosch University. And um, that was all while I was completing my, my adoption thesis, uh, my master's thesis in adoption research. Next slide, please. So this has been a 14 year journey. And it doesn't mean that it has to take you 14 years. That just took me 14 years to qualify as a, a research psychologist. 
And the reason why I say this is because you need to choose the path that you want to take. It's just important that you need to understand that there are so many avenues and so many things that you can do and so many ways to go about it. And that ultimately the final destination is not just to become a psychologist, that you can remain and reach the counselor and you can perform so much good work in that capacity. And while you're doing that, um, decide and choose whether or not you still wish to become a psychologist. And I need to say that I've actually been less limiting in the space that I am in now, as currently I am lecturing um, at, at SACAP and I've lectured mostly community orientated in South, South African diversity modules and community intervention type models modules as well um, at SACAP and for the past three years now, since 2017. And they're just having my graduate degree afforded me that opportunity already. Then I'm also a SACAP uh, supervisor. So I supervise undergrad students and I've been doing that also for two years. And then, uh, and because I also have my um, years of experience in counseling, it allows me to be able to sort of supervise undergraduate students. At the same time, just so that I can use my skill in research, I also am a um, researcher part-time for UCT. And uh, like I said, that's what I want to speak to, the research aspect. Once you're even a, a graduate, you are able to even um, apply for research opportunities at different um, institutions. And this allows you to be able to conduct um, psychological research. What I'm involved in at the moment is child development research in townships such as Paul and um, Mbukweni in the Borland. And then one of the final qualifications that I attained in 2018 was as a FAMAC trained mediator. And this is where I now conduct pro bono work um, for, uh, on behalf of myself, I'm just trained by FAMAC. Uh, and I do family care contact for best interests of the children for, uh, on a monthly basis at the um, Weinberg Children's Court. And that is quite an interesting, um, full circle for me because a lot of what I've been teaching has been family oriented, orientated and community orientated. And so these are all the areas I get to work in. And it sounds sometimes or may appear like a one big hustle, um, which I can say it really was, but being in psychology for the last 16 years, I can truly say I haven't been bored one day in my life. And I don't know many professions that can really, professions that can stand that ground or professionals that can really, or people in certain employments that can say that. And so I've enjoyed my journey. It hasn't been a constant struggle. There has been difficulties, there has been challenges, but you need to understand that it's the journey and how you get there is up to you. It's just that you need to be open to come and serve people and you need to realize that our current community and our current country is not a platform of roses um, and that there are a lot of brokenness and a lot of hurt out there. And then once you walk into the space, just be willing and wanting to make a difference in this world. So that is just me sharing a bit of myself and my experience. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. Oh, my apologies. Um, I've already spoken to this and um, basically just some insight into that was just selecting an area of focus like I did with addiction and approaching NGOs as well as important. Uh, you can develop your own programs or initiate your own projects and um, approach different places. So just remember that your future is in your own hands and what you make of it. So do not think if there's no job opportunities that you don't can't create opportunities. Thank you. Good evening all and thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Sherith, for, for the lovely insights and experiences you've shared with us. I feel sincerely honored to be talking on this platform this evening. I'm Nabila. I currently hold the position of program coordinator at SACAP's Cape Town campus and am a registered counselor myself. This evening, I want to share with you all a little bit about my journey and what has led me to where I am now. So I'd like to start by why I chose to become a registered counselor. I think of myself as having, as having an inquiring mind, someone who is curious and has a passion for knowledge. I'm driven by empathy and compassion, and I do think that I'm motivated to succeed. With this, 
Fulfillment through acts of service became a lifelong goal and something I had envisioned for myself and something that I knew I wasn't going to get bored of doing every single day of my life. And it, it, it became more about who I am as a person as opposed to a job title or career or anything of that sort. It really is more a personal thing than it is a career. After studying medicine at university, because I wanted to become the doctor with the white lab coat and the stethoscope around my neck, I was exposed to many things in the medical field, including psychology modules along the way. And through these experiences, I soon realized that psychology resonated with me far more than medicine ever did. And that's when I kicked myself into gear and changed direction and joined the SACAP team as a student in 2010. I was so passionate at the time that I'd done almost everything of what SACAP had to offer at the time, from a certificate course right through to a professional program and became a registered counselor. Although I must admit that I never really knew what I wanted to be and that I thought that only a psychologist can practice psychology. Through lots of self-exploration and research, I found that the scope of practice of the registered counselor as Sherith has touched on aligned very closely to the work I saw myself doing in terms of, com of community involvement and upliftment, which is the heart of SACAP too. And so many have asked, you know, how do you become a registered counselor? What do you need to study? Which programs or courses lead to becoming a registered counselor? So if we can move on to the next slide. So there are many various pathways that can lead one to becoming a registered counselor. I personally chose the SACAP way and have absolutely no regrets. SACAP's Bachelor of Psychology is a professional qualification that leads to registration with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, the HPCSA, as a registered counselor. It's a four year full time program. But before I get into the actual program, I want to share with you the SACAP experience. So if we can move on. Throughout my studies, I gained the knowledge and essential practical skills in order to provide good quality psychological care to people at a primary mental health care level, which in my opinion is where it's needed most in South Africa. This degree provides a thorough grounding in knowledge, theory and principles of the profession of a registered counselor, as well as exposure to research in the field of psychology. And like I mentioned, the Bachelor of Psychology program leads to registration with the HPCSA. And with this qualification, graduates are eligible for admissions into a master's degree in psychology, the social sciences, or any related fields, both nationally and internationally. So it is a recognized qualification. If we can move on. But apart from that, what really stood out for me coming from a different university was the diversity at SACAP. Both inside and outside the classroom, you're surrounded by people of all walks of life with a unique background and something very different to offer. At SACAP, you're also not just a number. Educators and staff know you by name. Classroom sizes are big enough to accommodate the, university, uh, the diversity, sorry, and small enough to build lasting relationships and cohesive bonds with classmates. The classroom environment is also one of great interaction where you engage with, with like-minded students, where everyone's voices are heard, valued and accepted. SACAP really is the place to be. And what I've learned at SACAP goes way beyond what exists in a textbook. So if we can move on. What I walked away with is personal growth on a level that I could never have imagined. I gained a refined sense of self-awareness, confidence and mindfulness, not just of myself, but of those around me as well. My professional development skyrocketed as I became a competent and confident counselor through the practice of skills, techniques and learning to work interdependently. At SACAP, you also get the opportunity to engage with educators who are professionals in the field themselves and have lots to share. So essentially, you're getting more than just an educator imparting knowledge, but sharing life experiences and guidance too. In addition to the things I've learned, the next slide speaks into what opportunities were available to me through my studies at SACAP. So as the name says, 
SACAP is a college of applied psychology where the gap between theory and practice is bridged. Students gain practical skills through SACAP's application-based training. Many of the programs offered by SACAP, including the Bachelor of Psychology course, have a built-in work integrated learning or practicum component. So students get a feel for the real working environment. And this exposure means that students graduate work ready. Added to that, the work integrated learning or practicum component is a great space for students to network and to really put yourself out there. Um, so there's also huge potential for employment. I am a firm believer that one is to create a door for yourself. Sometimes we spend our days, weeks, or even months waiting for opportunities or for doors to open for us. But instead, we forget that we can create those spaces for ourselves. And SACAP's Bachelor of Psychology will give you that kickstart. So we can move on. All the knowledge and skills I've learned are aspects I draw on and use every day of my life be it in my job or my interactions with friends and family, even in the way I practice self-care. Remember right at the beginning, I said that I'm still in the helping profession and it's more than just a job, it's who I am. Okay, on the next slide, many, many have asked what I'm currently doing with my qualification. And as I mentioned, I'm currently employed as SACAP's program coordinator at the Cape Town campus. What I do is still within the helping profession as my fundamental role is to provide support, empathy, and motivate and encourage. I pride myself on providing students with the same amazing experience that I was afforded while studying at SACAP. So even though I'm not in the direct space of one-on-one -on -one or even family or community counseling, I am still within the helping profession and using my qualification as a registered counselor. Next, we'll chat a bit about the HPCSA, the Health Professions Council of South Africa. So the HPCSA is a statutory body established in, in terms of the Health Professions Act and is committed to protecting the public and guiding the professions. The HPCSA, together with the 12 professional boards under its ambit, is established to provide, to provide for control over the education, training and registration for practicing of health professions registered under the Health Professions Act. The Bachelor of Psychology qualification, like we've mentioned many times throughout the presentation, is a qualification that is HPCSA accredited and leads to registration as a registered counselor. Similarly, those seeking to become a psychologist would need to complete a professional master's degree and register with the HPCSA as well. What many students don't realize is that masters and being a clinical or counseling psychologist is not the be all and end all of psychology. Not only is entry into masters really tough and competitive, Sherit has very nicely outlined the endless opportunities available for registered counselors, as well as their need, particularly in the South African context. The role of the registered counselor is to extend psychological services and make them accessible to the diverse South African population. A registered counselor conducts psychological and preventative interventions that focus on the promotion and enhancement of psychosocial well-being for individuals, families, groups, as well as communities. So to register with the HPCSA, after successfully completing the Bachelor of Psychology program, you'll be eligible to write the HPCSA board exam. Once you've passed the board exam, you're then able to register as a registered counselor. The same process of application takes place to register as a psychologist. However, in order to become a psychologist, you first have to complete an undergraduate degree followed by, followed by honors and then masters. And only after successful completion of a master's degree are you eligible to write the master's, uh, sorry, the psychology board exam and then register as a psychologist. So now that we've spoken a bit about the HPCSA, Masters and the Registered Counselor, let's look at the various pathways available. Can move on? Okay, so to recap, SACAP's Bachelor of Psychology is a four-year full-time professional degree that includes honors, 
and leads to registration with the HPCSA as a registered counselor. This qualification also positions you for admissions into a master's degree. So after the completion of this program, you're then also able to apply for masters. Okay, and the next slide. So like I mentioned, there are various ways that can lead to becoming a registered counselor or pursuing masters. And here are a few. Apart from the Bachelor of Psychology, SACAP offers a three-year undergraduate Bachelor of Applied Social Science degree with the option of majoring in three different areas. So you could choose to major in psychology and counseling, psychology and human resource management, or psychology and business management. This, followed by the one-year Honours in Psychology program, will also position you for admissions into a master's degree. So the general pathway to becoming a psychologist in South Africa starts with an undergraduate degree, followed by honours and then by masters. So to end off, I encourage you all to reach for your dreams. I leave you with a quote by George Herbert. Do not wait. The time will never be just right. Start where you stand and work with whatever tools you may have at your command and better tools will be found as you go along. Thank you. Thank you to both of our panelists, Sherith and Nabila, for sharing their insights with us this evening. Um, very valuable information. Um, we are going to be moving on to the Q&A section of our um, webinar this evening. As we continue, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, but you are welcome to continue posting them in the Q&A box as we go. Okay, let's get started. First one is for Sherith. Um, what, what employment opportunities are available to registered counsellors? Do organisations not prefer people with master's degrees? Okay, uh, thank you, Kirsten. So um, I had also mentioned that in the PowerPoint, um, where it's NGOs, police stations, different organizations, institutions, um, and it's all about obviously checking the or looking out on the job market, um, introducing yourself and networking within different health um, institutions and organizations and approaching people and approaching these places and to investigate and ask you know, where there might be or maybe employment opportunities. And like I said, if not, to look to ways to create your own. Um, the second part of that question was, sorry, person, you had mentioned something because it was about... The second part is, do organizations not prefer people with master's yeah. degrees? Perfect. Thank you. So just to answer the first one again, so once the recording has been uploaded, feel free just to read up again on the slides that I had presented because I have, there is sort of a nice diagram of different employment opportunities. Um, so no, there is, the, the, the difficulty at this point in South Africa is we need to understand our resources. So the more high, more qualified you are, the better paid you need to be, but at the same time, the position of management and so on. And we need more people on the ground. And so most organizations are looking for people that are skilled enough, qualified enough to do the job which is necessary. And like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, mental um, health challenges is one within six. So we deal with the majority, which is five in six. And so we need a majority of workforce on the ground to be able to assist our people in the people in our country. So having a master's degree can sometimes even more hinder your job opportunities than actually improve them. And we need to be very sort of aware of that. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Thanks for that one, um, Sherrod. The next one is for Nabila. Um, is the BSAC qualification the same or similar to the Bachelor of Applied Social Sciences degree? Thank you, Kirsten. Before I answer, I'd just like to apologize to you all this evening if you hear a bit of a drilling sound in the background. Okay, so to answer the question, the BSAC qualification is a four-year program that includes honors, right? Whereas your Bachelor of Applied Social Science is a complete, a full three-year undergraduate program. So the difference is that with the B-Psych, you've got your, your fourth year, which is your honors year included, 
as opposed to your Bachelor of Applied Social Science, where it's purely your three-year undergraduate course, which then allows you to apply for honours thereafter. Thank you, Kirsten. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nabila. Um, and then, Sheriff, another one for you. Um, do you have any views or comments about the Association for Supportive Counselors and Holistic Practitioners? Can you give us, give us an idea of the roots of study? Um, no, I don't have any thoughts or comments on that. Um, there are so many organizations that have sort of come up across the 16 years um, for Bachelor of Psychology or B-Psych registered counselors. So um, what I normally do is I associate my, or align myself with organizations and institutions or sorry, um, committees and associations that align with my value system. So that's usually how I would go about. So I'm not registered with CISA. Um, I was registered with the Registered Counselors Association and um, you really decide or choose who you want to work with and then not work with whoever does not align with your value system. So that's really how I chose and decided. So I don't have an opinion on them. Then um, the root of study, I think Nabila has spoken to that sufficiently as well. Thank you. Thanks, um, Sherith. Another one for you. Um, just regarding private practice, um, there's a question about if there, if the, um, the field is just saturate, saturated mm. with people that are opening up their private practices, is there a limit um, in terms of how many private practices can be in a certain area? Yeah, so there's no limit, but we need to be aware and conscious of the fact that the, the Bachelor of Psychology degree was meant for people to go and work in communities. So that is first and foremost, the, the greatest drive for creating this degree. And so when they were at the beginning, not many job opportunities in communities and organizations and institutions, a lot of our, my colleagues were forced to create a private practice for themselves. And so um, what you find is, is that you, we don't, most of a majority of our population are, live in poverty or they, are live, they live with lack of resources. And so if every person that qualifies with a BSAC qualification goes into private practice, you will probably maybe see one to five clients a year um, because you need to consider the ratio of the population in South Africa, where we get our clients from and where we are able to serve the clients are in organizations and in, in at institutions. So private practice is not necessarily, let me put it that way, financially feasible, um, because if everyone goes into private practice and not enough can afford the service, then it doesn't become worthwhile endeavor. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks, Sherry. That makes sense. Um, Nabila, the next one is for you. Um, so the attendee has asked um, and said, I'm currently studying a BA in, sorry, just give me one second. I'm currently doing a BA in health and community psychology. Can I then register as a counselor? How long will it take and where do I register? So thank you, Kirsten. So in order to register as a registered counselor with the HPCSA, that's South Professions Council of South Africa, you do have to complete a very specific program. Um, so something like a Bachelor of Psychology program. A BA, to my understanding, is an undergraduate program, right? That doesn't enable you to directly apply to the HPCSA. You're not eligible to write the board exam, it's just an undergraduate Bachelor of Arts degree. You would have to complete an honors year, so something like our Bachelor of Psychology full four-year qualification in order to register with the HPCSA. Like I mentioned, the process of that is upon successful completion, you need to apply to write the board exam, the HPCSA's board exam that is, and only upon um, you passing that board exam are you then able to go on and complete your registration as a registered counselor. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks for that, Nabila. The next one is also for you. Um, there's someone that wants to know a little bit more about your practicum experience when you were studying to become a registered counsellor. So my practicum experience, I think, was probably one of the best experiences I've had so far as a student. Um, I was fortunate enough to be placed, you know, at an organization that is very closely aligned to what my interests were at the time. And that was working in the community, working with um, impoverished people from, from disadvantaged backgrounds and, um, you know, just getting to work both individually one-on-one -on -one with people as well as in groups. 
And I think that experience, like I said, has given me more than just experience in terms of gaining counseling skills and gaining the knowledge, but also to network, also to get a chance to put myself out there and meet like-minded people um, who were not always necessarily on the same journey as me, but people who had the same kind of passion, the same motivation. And I think that is one of um, the most special things and one of the most important things that I got to experience through my studies at Sega was that hands-on practical experience from the very first day that I'd stepped into classes. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Nabila. Um, and Sherit, would you be able to just make the distinction between a psychologist and a registered counsellor? So a psychologist is someone that has their master's degree. And a registered counselor is someone that has the degree as a straight bachelor of psychology. So not majoring in psychology or in some way connected or just a module in psychology. You need a bachelor's in, in psychology to be a registered counselor. Um, and then obviously, like I said, a master's degree to become a research psychologist, a clinical psychologist, a um, community psychologist or a counseling psychologist. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And with that, you, I think maybe to clarify with that, the difference, the significant difference is they are able to diagnose and do clinical work um, and work with psychological conditions and psychiatric um, disorders, and we don't. I think your slides covered that quite nicely as well. Um, I think let's have a look at some of these other questions. Um, there's quite a few questions about um, if Becoming a registered counsellor first allows you a better opportunity to go on to do your master's at maybe a later stage. I'm not sure if you want to talk into that. Share it. So when you apply for your master's, they look at so many different avenues or aspects of your career. And they look at life experience, lived experience, work experience. And you being a registered counsellor, you've already been exposed automatically to different communities or to the real depths of communities because you were able to function as a health professional. If you were not able to do that, just having a degree and trying to sort of um, apply for masters, it could be limiting. So the opportunities that you get in, as a registered counselor allows you current employment, which is much easier than if you didn't um, qualify as a registered counselor. And then at the same time also um, allows you opportunities that improve your, your chances of um, being admitted into the clinical or counseling program for in psychology later. Okay. Can I add Fantastic. to that, Kirsten? Sure, so, go ahead. Can yep. I add to that? I think, um, I think what what many students, you know, often think is that, you know, after my qualification, before I apply for master, you know, I need to go out there and get some experience. I need to, you know, my experience that I get needs to be aligned to whether it be counseling experience or any related experience in terms of um, the specific masters or the, the specific psychology field you're applying for. And and what I found in my experience is that it doesn't really matter what, what the actual experience is. What matters is what you've learned from it, how it's changed you, how it's impacted you, how you've grown and developed from that. So it's not so much about, you know, what experience you're getting or, you know, whether you've gone into a children's home to work with kids if you want to, you know, maybe focus on um on working with children as a psychologist, but it's more around what you've learned from the things you have done. So if I can just add that and put that out there as well. Yeah, very important. Definitely. I think it, it comes down to what you make of the experience, I, I suppose. Thank you for that, um, mm -hmm. Nabila. Um, there's another interesting question, and I think this could go to either Sherith or Nabila or both, um, asking about registered counsellors need to do CPD points. Does anyone want to take that one? Okay, 16 years of doing it, I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> go for it, Sherith. <laughs> So, yes, um, the importance for that is because we're governed by the Health Professionals Council, they need to ensure that our skill set and the work and the, that we do in the communities are, are sort of man monitored and that it obviously provides the best ethical skill set that any community of indi or individual deserves. So, being in the health profession, we are expected to continuously grow our knowledge and continuously improve our skill set and continuously um, grow ourselves so that we are at the forefront um, providing the best 
um, care for our clients and for the communities that we work in. So it is a way to ensure that all health professionals are held accountable um, to that growth and that commitment through um, which we then agree to the code of conduct when we graduate and when we do register to provide best care through the latest techniques and training that is available to us. So that is the requirement of CPD. It's called continuous development um, and it can cost um, some money, uh, depends. There's also different ways of attaining the points as you can go across. You could possibly do one big program a year um, and that can cover your whole CPD points for the year or one big program that is enough for two years. There's different ways to be able to um, invest in your development in, in CPD. Okay, great. Uh, Nabila, do you want to add anything to that one? I think what, what Shares touched on, I think, is, is really important in terms of, you know, staying up to date, staying, you know, alive to developments in the field and just keeping yourself updated in terms of skills and knowledge. And, and, and for me, that is, that is the main reason behind the whole CPD point and, and um, the HPCSA regulating that professionals are maintaining a certain standard. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Sherith, this one is for you. So you mentioned quite a few of the different environments that um, registered counsellors are working in. Um, mm -hmm. Would a registered counsellor qualify to work in a clinic? If so, what type of work would they do? Yes, definitely. Um, you, you see, as I said, the health department has slowly started opening up their doors to us. And what would happen is, is that you need to go onto the health um, department's website and look at and other websites, health websites, um, to look at job opportunities. But you would basically do counseling. Um, a lot of the work at the moment would be abortion and um, support uh, counseling, as well as um, HIV AIDS counseling, as well as trauma counseling. So those are the three main focus areas at the moment that are family clinics. Um, and so, yeah, so you would do counseling services. If you're employed directly by the health department, you might get a mandate to conduct different health awareness programs as well. But that depends on the job description that they um, obviously have put forward. Okay, thank you for that, Cherith. Um, another question for you is, um, do I need a master's to become a marriage counsellor? Okay, so um, there are different, just like I am now an addiction specialist because I was trained following my qualification through a separate um, institution. Um, there are opportunities like that, even in parenting um, training as well. And so you could then consider or call yourself that or term yourself that or coin yourself that when you advertise um, your, your, your services. Um, but you would need to be clear, you need to be clear that you are not a clinical counseling psychologist. So you need to, you can stipulate marriage counselor, what institution you received your training from, and it would still be, I have to say B psych or, or B psych sci or whatever it is that your final uh, professional qualification entails because otherwise it might appear as misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree with that. And I think just highlighting the training that you have received that makes you equipped to do that type of work. Um, very, very crucial. Um, the next one for you is, um, what point is the best at which to hone in your focus in a sense? As in, okay. when is best to try and focus your skills and specialize in a specific field? It completely depends on you. Um, some people discover it in their practicum and it might not even be the same all the time. It's just that you need to understand that it's impossible to focus on everything all the time. And that's the main point. A lot of people think I'm going to go into the world, I'm going to go into, this, into the communities, I'm going to do everything. But there's so much knowledge, research and interventions that need to be incorporated and applied in what you do that you cannot know everything for every aspect of life. So try and if you don't know yet, try different things. Um, first work with family work or, or work with adolescents or work with just children um, or do school counseling or, um, you know, like I, my first qualification, my first um, uh, employment opportunity was with Sanka. So that was an addiction. I still am appreciative of the work that I did. But for me, dealing with relapse, clients that relapse was not necessarily the best part of my day. 
And so I would find that I would become sort of um, a little bit frustrated by that process and realize, okay, so I want to work in a space that is a little bit more positive and hopeful in the sense that uh, maybe I'm more in um, following positive psychology and preventative work. So that's why now my area of focus is family and relationships. And so that's how you sort of start to grow and figure out um, where you fit in and what serves you and where you are best equipped. And then you can develop the skill from there. So it's really a, a sort of a touch and go, put your feelers out there and then see what sits well with you. Okay, definitely does make sense. I think sometimes we think we might um, be more um, keen on one area, but once we try things out, we figure out that something else might be more suited to us. So thank you for that, um, Sherith. So Sherith, this one will be for you. Um, so this attendee is saying they're currently um, studying psychology. They want to be a psychologist, very interested in um, certain disorders such as depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, um, but they are a bit lost when it comes to which master's path to, to follow. Um, could you share some insights into that? Yeah. Okay, so well, that's called clinical work. So you would be able to do your clinical psychologist qualification, master's degree. Um, that's a two-year process at best, and it includes your internship and a master's thesis, as well as other modules that you need to attend. Um, so yeah, so that would be clinical psychology, and that is your best training. Um, funny enough, though, to mention, counseling and clinical psychologists sit in the same classroom but the one is allowed and afforded um, clinical work. So you could even get jobs at different clinical institutions, Lentechia, um, and so forth, um, and work directly with people in, um, that are being, have been admitted for psych psychiatric or psychological disorders. But that, is, that would be your, you could do counseling, but then you would really be working on a much lesser platform in those aspects with, the counts, with your clients outpatient than rather than inpatient. Okay. And, and bearing that in mind, um, what sort of fields would you say a counselling psychologist would mo more focus on? So they would be the ones that would work on marriage counselling and uh, child rearing practices. And um, we're looking at anything in life, relationships. So they would be quite ideal when someone has been sort of um, uh, in a program, institutionalised program for, let's say even schizophrenia or um, <laughs> depression. And so you would be able to then see a counseling psychologist outside as an outpatient. And that counseling psychologist, because they're trained in the understanding and the diagnosis of these um, um, conditions, they would be able to then provide you with a therapy necessary to maintain a healthy lifestyle outside of an institution. Okay, great. And then I think our last question for this evening, um, Sherith, if you don't mind answering this one as well, is um, can you rewrite the board exam if you do not pass the first time? Yes, you can. There was, Kirsten, sorry, there was just one, I think that is important um, question mm -hmm. um, from Stevie, um, where I mentioned about getting turned down for masters. Yes. I don't know if you noticed that one. I think that's quite an important one. Is it possible if I can just answer that one? Definitely. Okay, perfect. So, yes, it's very important. Um, it's not something that I was told about when I entered into this field. And it's not a conversation that's really have even by your lecturers, at, well, before. And so, um, okay, so it's all about stats. And I don't know the current stats, but I know the realist, sort of the realism of it. And you have about 500 psychology students graduating per year throughout the country, and that, that's at best a minimum. Um, and when I say psychology students, it could be those also B psych, uh, sorry, BA majoring in psychology. So there's a lot of ways that people can um, obtain a degree. Um, yes, we know now that there are other aspects before you can apply for masters, but um, the point is, is that you have 500 students about minimum. Uh, and then you have only 10 to 12 places per institution per year across the country. So that equates to maybe 100. Um, and if you look at the backlog of people applying that have actually more work experience, that are more mature, and all of these other aspects you need to take into place, and they also take um, race and gender into account as well um, in the current program. So there's a lot that happens around statistics and representation. Um, so it's important to understand that it's a risky endeavor 
it's not guaranteed. And so um, every year, there is only 50 people across the country accepted. So let's say 450 people that gets moved over to the following year and an additional 500 that are, that, that are graduating the following year. And that numbers keep on piling up. And so statistically, your chances are very little for any individual. And, so, and it's not to say that if you make it, you are better than everyone else. If you don't, the process itself is very demanding. The process itself can be quite um, objective and subjective. It is not a guarantee. Um, you're working constantly with different personalities. That year, you might just not present with what they have and what they're looking for in their mandate of, of students that they're hoping to um, have for that specific year. And so it could just be the wrong year that you applied. Um, and I say this sort of with a giggle because if you take that too seriously, you will be disappointed and you will get stuck and you will feel stuck. I've enjoyed 16 years and I've been through two. Um, the question was where have I applied? The first time I only applied to my alma mater, which was UWC. Um, and they questioned me as to why they didn't apply everywhere else. And that was problematic to them or concern to them. Um, that was unsuccessful. And then um, I took the advice that the second time around and I applied to Stellenbosch University, UCT and uh, UWC. And then um, I got invited to both UCT and Stellenbosch University. And the response at that time was that I'm capable, but not competent. And so I could take and walk away from that was I was too much in, you know, I was too long in, in teaching, too much, you know, involved in life orientation and too little involved in, in, in grassroots counseling and intervention. And that's when I decided, well, I'm not going to wait until I get accepted into a program. And I looked at my other opportunities and I went into Salem Boston University and I spoke to the admissions um, clerk at um, the psychology department. And she suggested if I'm happy with being a registered counselor, and I don't necessarily feel driven for clinical work, but I want to improve my opportunities in psychology um, and just grow myself, I should consider the research masters. And that's what I did. I applied that same year. Um, and the following year in 2014, I began my research masters, um, which I successfully completed. And that did allow and afford me other job opportunities as well. But yet I can still function as a registered counselor. I can still counsel. I can still provide the exact same services as I have before. I just have the additional skills with a mastery of research in psychology. Thanks for sharing that, um, Sheriff. I think that always makes me think of every single year. Um, we always look forward to hearing from a lot of our students about their um experiences of going through selection weeks and a lot of them do end up being accepted in in um, different programs across the country and even across the world which is always lovely to to hear about especially our BSAC graduates. Um, so though, that concludes our Q&A session for this evening. Thank you so much to our panelists and to everyone that did pop their questions into the chat. I do know that there are a lot of unanswered questions, so we are aware of that. And our team is busy making a note of all of them to ensure that they do get answered. If you do, if you would like more information, you can pop your details into the chat and someone from um, our team will get back to you about that. So, um, you are welcome to visit our social media pages for the recording of this webinar, as well as any other program, open day or webinar announcements. We would also like to extend and invite our upcoming virtual open day sessions, where we will be sharing more information on our programs for students that would like to study at our physical campuses, as well as our online campus. The details for the open days were shown on the screen, but I do just want to say that it's important to be mindful that applications for the BSIC program mentioned in this webinar tonight close on the 30th of October. So if you are interested and you would like to get some more information, please do schedule a consultation with one of our admissions officers. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope you have a lovely evening further.